one of the ugliest traits of fallen humanity has to be greed. You know, we think of green-eyed greed, and, and it is indeed ugly. Leo Tolstoy once told or wrote a story about a successful peasant farmer who was not satisfied with what he owned. And so he, was, he wanted more of everything, and one day he received a novel offer for 1,000 rubles. He could have as much land as he could walk around in one day. The only catch was that he had to return to the starting point by the end of the day, by sundown. Early the next morning, he started out walking at a fast pace. By midday, he was very tired already, but he kept going, covering more and more ground. Well into the afternoon, he realized that he, uh, his greed had taken him far from the starting point. And so he quickened his pace as the sun soon began to sink low in the sky. He began to run, knowing that if he did not make it back by sundown, the opportunity to become an even bigger landowner would be lost. As the sun began to sink at the horizon, he came within sight of the finish line and grasping for breath, his heart pounding, he called on every last bit of strength left in his body and he staggered across the finish line just before the sun disappeared from the horizon. He immediately collapsed, blood oozing out of his mouth and a few minutes later, he was dead. Afterwards, his servant dug a grave. It was not much over six feet long and three feet wide. Greed is a very ugly, fallen trait in humanity. It's curious that we only tend to criticize greed when we see it on a personal level, that is, individuals who demonstrate greed. And I'm going to talk about this morning the solution to the sin of greed in, in our hearts. But I am amazed that we can't see perhaps the biggest greed that is in front of our eyes on a daily basis, right here in America. We have a civil government, my friends, that is drunk on greed. That's right. It never has enough. Not enough of our hard-earned money, not enough of our possessions, not enough of our land. 640 million acres of unconstitutionally held and illegal land held by the federal government is not enough. They want all of the land. And that's what's happening out there in the West. That's what the ranchers are facing in the West. I've put the letter on the table if you want to read the whole letter, but Ammon Bundy, writing from prison this week as a political prisoner, which is what he is, he explained the problem of the federal land grab out west and how they were teaching ranchers how to resist the tyranny that they're seeing there. He said on Friday afternoon, this was actually four days after they were arrested, so they had this meeting planned that obviously did not take place. The residents surrounding Jordan Valley, Oregon, had scheduled a seminar with those at the refuge to come and inform them how they could protect themselves from a national monument which is to be signed by Obama this year, 2016. The monument is twice the size of Yellowstone, takes up one third of the county's land mass, and will put out over 250 ranchers out of business as they know it. Do they have enough land? Oh no, they are greedy for more and the limits to their greed, the greed of our federal government seem to know no bounds. Scripture teaches us that a people who will not be ruled by God's law will ultimately be ruled by tyrants. And that's what's happened in America. Having rejected God's law as true law, we are being ruled by tyrants. And of course, the solution is to return to God's law, to return to obedience of God's law. By the way, an excellent study of every passage in the Bible dealing with the issue of taxation has been done by Robert Fugate, and he concludes that God's design for taxation in the Hebrew Republic, which was the government God designed as the best design for government, the <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> taxation was extremely small, so small that even the poorest person could pay and everybody paid exactly the same amount. And that is God's system of justice. Oh, to God that we would have such a system of civil government today. 
a civil government was a small, a civil government that did not regulate every area of our life, did not control us, did not spy on us, manipulate us, steal our land and property and murder the people who stand up and resist it in any way, shape, or form. Well, what does the law of God say about giving? Because that's the solution to greed. Turn, if you would, to Exodus chapter 22 as we continue in our study. True law is God's law. Exodus 22 and verses 29 and 30 give us the solution to the human problem of greed. Look at Exodus 22 and verse 29. Thou shalt not delay to offer the first of thy ripe fruits and of thy liquors, the firstborn of thy sons, thou shalt give unto me. Likewise thou shalt do with thine oxen and with thy sheep. Seven days it shall be with his dam, and on the eighth day thou shalt give it to me. God commanded the people of Israel to give the first fruits and the firstborn to him, and to do so without delay. This principle of the first fruits means there's a risk being taken on the part of the one giving that first fruits. It had to express that you trusted that God would provide more than the first that you already offered up to him. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy 26, where again, this is such an important principle that it is repeated. Deuteronomy 26 and verse 9. Here it says, And he hath brought us into this place, and hath given us this land, even a land that floweth with milk and honey. And now, behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which thou, O Lord, hast given me. And thou shalt set it before the Lord thy God and worship before the Lord thy God. And we see here that giving is an act of worship. We worship God, and one aspect of worshiping him is what we give to him. Now, the reason the first fruits took trust on the part of the, the giver is consider what a farmer was facing. You see, you're not guaranteed the whole harvest until you've brought all the harvest into the barn. And so to give the first fruits risks that something might happen to the rest of that harvest. A terrible storm might arise and destroy the rest of the harvest, and you've already given the first fruits, so what's left? You see, we... This principle of giving the first fruits means that we trust that God is the one who is going to provide for us no matter what. I read about a missionary who was teaching people in his church about this principle of giving the first fruits. And a couple days later, one of the members of the congregation came to his door with his fishing pole in hand and a fish in the other hand. And the missionary said, oh, what's going on? He said, oh, I wanted to bring God the first fruits. And uh, the, the missionary asked him, oh, so you've caught a lot of other fish? He said, no, 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 the other fish are still in the river. I'm going to catch the other fish. And that's the principle of the first fruits. It means you're taking a risk by giving to God at the very beginning of the harvest, the very beginning of that which God has entrusted. You see, what God wants us to do in giving is demonstrate that we trust him to provide for us. Perhaps you've heard of a man of great faith, George Mueller, back in the uh, 19th century, God led him to establish an orphanage in England. And at one point, his orphanage had a thousand kids, and that's a, a lot of mouths to feed. And one morning, there was absolutely no food in the pantry, none whatsoever. No food to feed the children in that orphanage. But he called all the children and all the staff together, and then they prayed. They prayed thanking God for the provision of the food, even though there was no food on the table. Shortly after they prayed that prayer, they heard a knock on the door, and a baker was at the door. And the baker said, last night God moved me to bake this bread for the orphanage, and here, I'm bringing it to you. It wasn't long after the bread came in, there was another knock on the door, and it was the milkman. He said, my milk truck just broke down, and this milk is all going to spoil, and I want to give it, these big cans of milk, I want to give it to the orphanage. And they praised God because he answered prayer. They trusted in him. And you see, that's what giving demonstrates, that we are trusting God for our provision. And it takes faith to give as God calls us to give. Furthermore, giving reminds us, it reminds us as the giver, that God owns it all. It all ultimately belongs to him. He created all things, and he entrusts us with part of what he has created. He entrusts us as his 
stewards. And that means ultimately we will give account to him for how we have used the master's goods, the goods that belong to him and how we have used them for his kingdom. I think of uh, the fact that often we don't think of what we have as really belonging to God. We think, well, this is mine. You know, I, I earned this. I worked for this. And so it's mine. I think the illustration of a woman who had finished her shopping and returned to her car, and she found four men in the car. Well, she dropped her shopping bags and drew her handgun and screamed, I have a gun and I know how to use it. Get out of the car. Well, the four men didn't need any extra invitation. They ran uh, as fast as they could from this crazy woman. Now, the woman was so shaken, but she loaded her shopping bags into the car and got in. And no matter how hard she tried, she could not get the key to fit into the ignition. Until it dawned on her that her car was five lots away. And shocked, she took her groceries, went over to her car, put them in her car, and drove down to the police station to turn herself in as the one who had caused this terrible disruption. And uh, as she began to tell her story to the desk sergeant there at the police station, he started laughing so much he almost fell off his chair. And he pointed down the end of the counter and he said, uh, yeah, those four men, they're reporting a carjacking of an old woman with thick glasses and curly white hair, less than five feet tall, carrying a large handgun. Well, no charges were, were issued to her. You see, she thought it was her car. And had it been her car, well, that would have been understandable. She didn't realize it belonged to someone else. We think of our lives and often we think of our possessions and those things that we are entrusted as our own. But we, what we really need to do is think of them as God owns them. They belong to him. And everything we have has come from his hands. The problem for many today is they believe, well, they would give more generously if they had more money. You can talk to plenty of people and that's what they'll say. Oh, if I had more, you know, if I was making a lot of money, I would give more. But that doesn't seem to fit with the actual facts that we know. For example, Forbes magazine ran an article back in 2008. They determined that there was 946 billionaires in the world in 2007. And that 946 billionaires gave an average of one 0.2% of their income to charitable causes in the course of the year. Wait a minute, you're a billionaire? You got this, yeah, a billionaire, but uh, you won't give. You see, being gen generous, whatever amount, is being generous understanding that God has given us these things. We are his stewards, and we as his stewards need to ask him how he would have us handle that which he's entrusted to us. You see, it's never an issue of how much we have or how little we have. Rather, it's our perspective. To whom do the things belong that we do have in our possession? They are God's, and he's entrusted them to us in order that we may be good stewards of that which actually belongs to him. Do you know who gives you the power to get wealth? Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 11 and 12. And God was speaking to the children of Israel, warning them in Deuteronomy 8. They were about to move into a land. Remember, they had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Now, all of a sudden, for the first time in their memory, nobody could remember being, you know, a, a, a wealthy person. For the first time, they were going to own property. They were not going to be slaves any longer in the land of promise. And God warned them. This is Deuteronomy 8 and verse 11. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God, in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day, lest when thou hast eaten and are full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein and when thy herds and uh, thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, who led thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, my power, and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power 
to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them, I testify against you this day, that ye shall surely perish. And the nations which the Lord destroyed before your face, so shall ye perish, because you would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. So we need to remember continually that it's even the power to get wealth is something that God has given to us, and that if he hadn't given us that power, we would have nothing at all. Well, giving to God... <coughs> Excuse me. Giving to God is an act that reminds us continually that it's not in our own power to give wealth, to get wealth. It is God who gives us that power. And do you know that as a believer, it's actually a privilege to give to God? It is. Let me read to you what David said in 1 Chronicles 29, 14. David, after gathering together the people to gather the wealth of Israel to build the temple, he said, but who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee and of thine own have we given thee. So David recognized that everything he had and everything Israel had was something that God had given. And he was saying what a privilege it is, what an honor it is to be able to give back to God that which he has entrusted to us. I think our attitude needs to be about everything we own. How is it being used for the kingdom of God? David Livingston, a uh, groundbreaking missionary to the interior of Africa, he said this, I place no value on anything I have or may possess except in relation to the kingdom of God. If anything will advance the, the interest of the kingdom, it shall be given away or kept only as by giving or keeping it I shall most promote the glory of him to whom I owe all my hopes in time or eternity. That's a perspective that we need. That's a perspective that we should emulate. God desires that we give, and he commands that we give, but the heart attitude that he really desires is that of a cheerful and willing giver. If you turn to Exodus 25 and verse 2, Exodus chapter 25 and verse 2, here God commanded the people of Israel in preparation, by the way, to build the tabernacle. They were gathering much of the wealth that they had accumulated and they were going to give it to God to build the tabernacle. And he said, speak unto the children of Israel that they may bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. So God commands us to give. But he commands us to give with a willing heart because we desire to give. You know, we are also commanded by God to give with a cheerful heart. A cheerful heart recognizing that it is a privilege to give to God. <coughs> Excuse me. Some of you know the, the history of our war for independence. And a Frenchman, Marquis de Lafayette, was very, very instrumental in helping win many of the battles he proved an invaluable assistance to George Washington and the struggling American army. Now, after the war was over, he returned to France, returned to his life as a farmer. He had many estates on his, uh, his farms. And in 1783, the harvest in France was a terrible one. Uh, yet, the, and so there were many who were suffering terribly as a result. But Lafayette's farms were unaffected by the devastating crop failures. One of his workers, noting, noting what was happening in the marketplace, gave what he thought was good advice to Lafayette. He said, the bad harvest has raised the price of wheat. This is the time to sell. After thinking about it for a moment, thinking about the hungry peasants in the surrounding villages, Lafayette disagreed and said, no, this is the time to give. God has given to us, and he may call upon us at certain places and times to give, and to give uh, generously. God blesses us not just for our own benefit so that we can be a blessing to others who are in need. There's certainly no shortage of people in need uh, in the world today. While we can't meet every need, we can ask the Lord to guide us as his stewards. How would he use the, the funds and, and the resources he's entrusted to us 
to multiply and to work more effectively for his kingdom. I don't know who it was, but somebody said the happiest people on earth are the people who have discovered the joy of giving. In contrast, you would say the miserable people are those who are misers. And actually, the word miser is rooted in miserable there. And I'm not sure where uh, Carl Menninger, the famed uh, physician, where he got his research, but he concluded that generous people are rarely mentally ill, whereas he saw many miserly people were uh, mentally ill. Generous people are what God calls upon us to be. Turn, if you would, to the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, where Paul, echoing what we've already seen in Exodus, instructs the Corinthians in this fashion. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7. Every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. That word cheerful is often translated hilarious, somebody who is just rejoicing in that privilege of giving. I think Amy Carmelich is the one who wrote that you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. It goes hand in hand. Nothing brings the realization of our priorities better than hearing what God has to say about the subject of money and checking our own attitudes and our own understanding with what God's word clearly says about the subject of money. We can only give that which God has already entrusted to us as a steward of his funds. Reminds me of an outlandish story, but it's true. 67-year-old carpenter Russell Herman died in 1994, and his will included a staggering bequest. It included his plan of distribution $2 billion for the city of East St. Louis, another billion dollar and a half for the state of Illinois, two and a half billion for the national forest system, and top it off, Herman left six trillion, that's right with a T, six trillion dollars to the government to help pay off the national debt. Wow, sounds amazingly generous, doesn't it? There's a small problem, however. Herman's only assets when he died was a 1983 Oldsmobile. <laughs> he made grand pronouncements. He thought he was being generous, but obviously he didn't have what he was promising to give. Generosity, we need to remember, is not determined by the amount that we give, but rather by our hearts. You remember Jesus sitting there with his disciples in the temple or watching people come by and give money. They didn't pass the offering plate in that structure. They had a treasury box where people would put into the treasury box. He saw a widow come who had just the smallest, least uh, coins of all, the two mites that she put in. And he said, Verily I say unto you, this poor widow hath cast in more than all they which have cast into the treasury. And that is because she gave her all. She gave everything uh, that she had to the Lord. And that sacrificial giving is something that God honors and Jesus honored in that day. What's the best way to determine what we love? It's not our words, but it's what we do. It's what we do with our time, what we do with our money. You can tell whether it's a checkbook or a balance sheet, what a person does with time and money indicates their priorities. Now, going back to the Exodus passage we began with, Exodus 22, just quickly look, there's three categories of giving, and one's a rather unusual category. The first was the first fruits of the field. You know, when you bring in your crop of, of, of wheat or corn, whatever it would be, and the first fruits of the orchard when you pick your apples and so on. But then the fruit of the womb, we'll come back to that in a moment, and then the firstborn of the livestock. The first and last are a little easier to understand, but what about the firstborn of the womb? You see, the firstborn sons, actually, is what, uh, what Scripture says. We know that all children are the gift from God, that God gives us those children as a trust, as a stewardship, that we have them in our homes, perhaps for 20 or so years, and that we launch them out into the world as arrows to accomplish the work of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ that he has appointed for them. But notice what it says here, that the first of the womb, the first fruit, the firstborn, belongs especially to the Lord. And this is connected, of course, with Passover. We just celebrated the Lord's Supper, communion. Communion is rooted in the Passover. You remember that that night that Israel was to be delivered from Egypt, that night of the Exodus, God gave them instructions and said, the angel of death is going to come through the streets 
and the alleyways, every part of the land of Egypt. And only those firstborn that are under the blood will be spared from the angel of death. And so they had to take a lamb, an innocent lamb, slit his throat, spill his blood into a bowl, take hyssop and put it on the, on the doorpost and on the lintel. And that would protect that firstborn from the angel of death that came upon the land of Egypt on that day. Now, the lamb was slain in place of the firstborn. In other words, had the lamb not been slain, the firstborn would have been put to death by the angel of death. Do you know that in Christ, each of us is under the blood of the lamb in the same way? We are under the curse of sin and death. In a sense, the angel of death is on his way towards our home. It's only when we come under the blood of Jesus Christ by receiving him as Lord and Savior that we are spared what is otherwise a certain fate of eternal doom. Can you imagine what it would have been like for that firstborn son or daughter there in Egypt that night? You saw what your parents did in killing the lamb, putting the blood. Then you could hear. You knew where the angel of death was because you could hear the wails. You could hear the screams. You could hear the horror coming down your street. And you would hold your breath, I imagine, as it approached your house. Would that really work? Would, would the blood on the doorpost and the lintel be enough? Would it save your life? You'd hold your breath. And the angel of death passed over your house and began to slay all those in the houses that were not under the blood of the Lamb. I think if you were a firstborn child, you would never forget that night. You would remember it as long as you lived and you would tell your children that you were saved by the blood of the Lamb. That's our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our Passover Lamb. It is His blood shed for us that over the doorposts and the lintel of our heart protects us from what otherwise would be certain doom, eternal punishment. Now the firstborn were picked out by God to be the priests in the system of worship that God has established. And we won't turn there, but Exodus 13, verse 2, God says, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel. So God's design was the firstborn was going to have this special role because they were under the, bland, the blood of the Lamb. But for us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, that is expanded to not just the firstborn, it's expanded to everyone who is a follower of Jesus Christ. If you would turn to the New Testament in 1 Peter 2, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Notice what Peter writes to the believers. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So every one of us is called upon by God because we're under the blood of the Lamb in the sense we were all firstborn to be priests unto God, a royal priesthood. And it's not just in this life that we serve as a royal priesthood, which is to worship God and to tell others the good news about Jesus Christ. That's the function of a priest. It will be for all eternity as well that we shall be priests, royal priesthood. If you're there at 1 Peter, turn to Revelation 5. Revelation 5 speaks to this reality that for all eternity, this shall be our status. Revelation chapter 5, and look at... Uh, verses 9 and 10. Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. This is a song they're singing of Jesus Christ. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. So we have been called not just as kings and priests on this earth, but kings and priests for all eternity unto God. I find it fascinating here that there's only two institutions that God is speaking of. He created the institution of civil government, the kings, and the institution of church government, the priests. No mention here of family government. I find that a little curious, but 
thinking about it, what God has done in bringing us into his kingdom has made us all one in the family of God. And we have only one father, and that father is our God and father himself. And so we for all eternity will be kings and priests to God. Well, in addition to giving gifts to God, which is the role of a priest, we worship God as the royal priesthood. If you're there in Revelation, just turn back to Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Here it says, By him, therefore, as let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks unto his name. We are to praise and worship God as part of being a priesthood, a royal priesthood to God. In fact, you might say that uh, as believers in Jesus Christ, we are not crippled unless we cease to praise him. Lewis Albert Banks tells of an elderly Christian man who was a fine singer, had a beautiful voice, and he learned that he had cancer of the tongue. And so surgery was required, and in the hospital, after everything was ready for the operation, the man said to his doctor, are you sure I will never sing again? The surgeon found it difficult to answer his question, and he simply and he simply shook his head no. The patient then asked if he could sit up for a moment. Had many good times singing the praises of God, he said. And now you tell me I can never sing again. I have one song that will be my last. It will be gratitude and praise to God. There is in the doctor's presence a man sang softly the words of Isaac Watts' hymn. I'll praise my maker while I have breath. And when my voice is lost in death, praise shall employ my nobler power. And the days of praise shall never pass. 